the most vital ingredient in Indian cooking, the basic element with which all dishes begin and, normally, the cheapest vegetable available. The pink onion is an essential item in the shopping basket of families of all classes. A popular saying holds that you will never starve because you can always afford a roti, a piece of simple, flat bread, and an onion. But in recent weeks, the onion has started to seem an unaffordable luxury for India's poor. Over the past few days, another sharp surge in prices has begun to unsettle the influential urban middle classes. The sudden spike in prices has been caused by large exports to neighboring countries and a shortage of supply. With its capacity for bringing down governments and scarring political careers, the onion plays an explosive role in Indian politics. This week reports of rising onion prices have made front-page news and absorbed the attention of the governing elite. The most vital ingredient in Indian cooking, the basic element with which all dishes begin and, normally, the cheapest vegetable available, the pink onion is an essential item in the shopping basket of families of all classes. A popular saying holds that you will never starve because you can always afford a roti, a piece of simple, flat bread, and an onion. But in recent weeks, the onion has started to seem an unaffordable luxury for India's poor. Over the past few days, another sharp surge in prices has begun to unsettle the influential urban middle classes. The sudden spike in prices has been caused by large exports to neighboring countries and a shortage of supply. With its capacity for bringing down governments and scarring political careers, the onion plays an explosive role in Indian politics. This week reports of rising onion prices have made front-page news and absorbed the attention of the governing elite. I am a cyclist and a motorist. I fasten my seatbelt when I drive and wear a helmet on my bike to reduce the risk of injury. I am convinced that these are prudent safety measures. I have persuaded many friends to wear helmets on the grounds that transplant surgeons call those without helmets, donors on wheels. But a book on risk by my colleague John Adams has made me re-examine my convictions. Adams has completely undermined my confidence in these apparently sensible precautions. What he has persuasively argued, particularly in relation to seat belts, is that the evidence that they do what they are supposed to do is very suspect. This is in spite of numerous claims that seat belts save many thousands of lives every year. I am a cyclist and a motorist. I fasten my seat belt when I drive and wear a helmet on my bike to reduce the risk of injury. I am convinced that these are prudent safety measures. I have persuaded many friends to wear helmets on the grounds that transplant surgeons call those without helmets, donors on wheels. But a book on risk by my colleague John Adams has made me re-examine my convictions. Adams has completely undermined my confidence in these apparently sensible precautions. What he has persuasively argued, particularly in relation to seat belts, is that the evidence that they do what they are supposed to do is very suspect. This is in spite of numerous claims that seat belts save many thousands of lives every year. There is remarkable data from the year 1970 to 1978 in which countries with wearing of seat belts compulsory have had on average about 5% more road accident deaths following the introduction of the law. In the UK, road deaths have decreased steadily from about 7,000 a year in 1972 to just over 4,000 in 1989. There is no evidence in the trend for any effect of the seat belt law that was introduced in 1983. Moreover, there is evidence that the number of cyclists and pedestrians killed actually increased by about 10%. There is remarkable data from the year 1970 to 1978 in which countries with wearing of seat belts compulsory have had on average about 5% more road accident deaths following the introduction of the law. In the UK, road deaths have decreased steadily from about 7,000 a year in 1972 to just over 4,000 in 1989. 
there is no evidence in the trend for any effect of the seat belt law that was introduced in 1983. Moreover, there is evidence that the number of cyclists and pedestrians killed actually increased by about 10%. If after years of Spanish classes, some people still find it impossible to understand some native speakers, they should not worry. This does not necessarily mean the lessons were wasted. The confusion is partly political, the Spanish-speaking world is very diverse. Spanish is the language of 19 separate countries and Puerto Rico. This means that there is no one standard dialect. The most common Spanish dialect taught in the U.S. is standard Latin American. It is sometimes called Highland Spanish since it is generally spoken in the mountainous areas of Latin America. While each country retains its own accents and has some unique vocabulary, residents of countries such as Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia generally speak Latin American Spanish, especially in urban centers. This dialect is noted for its pronunciation of each letter and its strong R sounds. This Spanish was spoken in Spain in the 16th and 17th centuries and was brought to the Americas by the early colonists. However, the Spanish of Madrid and of northern Spain, called Castilian, developed characteristics that never reached the New World. If after years of Spanish classes, some people still find it impossible to understand some native speakers, they should not worry. This does not necessarily mean the lessons were wasted. The confusion is partly political, the Spanish-speaking world is very diverse. Spanish is the language of 19 separate countries and Puerto Rico. This means that there is no one standard dialect. The most common Spanish dialect taught in the U.S. is standard Latin American. It is sometimes called Highland Spanish since it is generally spoken in the mountainous areas of Latin America. While each country retains its own accents and has some unique vocabulary, residents of countries such as Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia generally speak Latin American Spanish, especially in urban centers. This dialect is noted for its pronunciation of each letter and its strong R sounds. This Spanish was spoken in Spain in the 16th and 17th centuries and was brought to the Americas by the early colonists. However, the Spanish of Madrid and of northern Spain, called Castilian, developed characteristics that never reached the New World. An Egyptian narrative of about 1080 BC, the story of when our men, provides an insight into the scale of their trading activity. One of the characters is Rokitai, a Phoenician merchant living at Tanis in Egypt's Nile Delta. As many as 50 ships carry out his business, plying back and forth between the Nile and the Phoenician port of Sidon. The most prosperous period for Phoenicia was the 10th century BC, when the surrounding region was stable. An Egyptian narrative of about 1080 BC, the story of when our men, provides an insight into the scale of their trading activity. One of the characters is Rokitai, a Phoenician merchant living at Tanis in Egypt's Nile Delta. As many as 50 ships carry out his business, plying back and forth between the Nile and the Phoenician port of Sidon. The most prosperous period for Phoenicia was the 10th century BC, when the surrounding region was stable. For all his fame and celebration, William Shakespeare remains a mysterious figure with regards to personal history. There are just two primary sources for information on the Bard, his works, and various legal and church documents that have survived from Elizabethan times. Naturally, there are many gaps in this body of information, which tells us little about Shakespeare the man. For all his fame and celebration, William Shakespeare remains a mysterious figure with regards to personal history. There are just two primary sources for information on the Bard, his works, and various legal and church documents that have survived from Elizabethan times. Naturally, there are many gaps in this body of information, which tells us little about Shakespeare the man.
Lawrence Stephen Lowry RBS Ra was an English artist. Many of his drawings and paintings depict Pendlebury, Lancashire, where he lived and worked for more than 40 years, and also Salford and its surrounding areas. Lowry is famous for painting scenes of life in the industrial districts of northwest England in the mid-20th century. He developed a distinctive style of painting and is best known for his urban landscapes peopled with human figures often referred to as much stick men. He painted mysterious unpopulated landscapes, brooding portraits and the unpublished Narian networks, which were only found after his death. Lawrence Stephen Lowry RBS Ra was an English artist. Many of his drawings and paintings depict Pendlebury, Lancashire, where he lived and worked for more than 40 years, and also Salford and its surrounding areas. Lowry is famous for painting scenes of life in the industrial districts of northwest England in the mid-20th century. He developed a distinctive style of painting and is best known for his urban landscapes peopled with human figures often referred to as much stick men. He painted mysterious unpopulated landscapes, brooding portraits and the unpublished Narian networks, which were only found after his death. In animals, a movement is coordinated by a cluster of neurons in the spinal cord called the Central Patterns Generator CPG. This produces signals that drive muscles to contract rhythmically in a way that produces running or walking, depending on the pattern of pulses. A simple signal from the brain instructs the CPG to switch between different modes, such as going from a standstill to walking. In animals, a movement is coordinated by a cluster of neurons in the spinal cord called the Central Patterns Generator CPG. This produces signals that drive muscles to contract rhythmically in a way that produces running or walking, depending on the pattern of pulses. A simple signal from the brain instructs the CPG to switch between different modes, such as going from a standstill to walking. When the Tottenham riots broke out a politician commented, this is criminality, pure and simple. To paraphrase Oscar Wilde, the riots were not very pure and the causes were not simple. It was clear, though, that social deprivation was among the causes. The Guardian newspaper reported that of 1,000 rioters going through the courts, fewer than 9% had a job or were in training. When the Tottenham riots broke out a politician commented, this is criminality, pure and simple. To paraphrase Oscar Wilde, the riots were not very pure and the causes were not simple. It was clear, though, that social deprivation was among the causes. The Guardian newspaper reported that of 1,000 rioters going through the courts, fewer than 9% had a job or were in training. In Mexico and Brazil, they have developed conditional cash transfer programs. They are what they say on the tin. Cash is given to women of low income, but there are conditions. Children have to be taken to nutrition and health clinics. Older children have to remain in school. In Brazil, the result has been great reductions in poverty and inequality, improvements in school attendance, especially of girls, and health improvements. Questions have been raised as to whether the conditionality is needed. In Mexico and Brazil, they have developed conditional cash transfer programs. They are what they say on the tin. Cash is given to women of low income, but there are conditions, 
children have to be taken to nutrition and health clinics, older children have to remain in school. In Brazil, the result has been great reductions in poverty and inequality, improvements in school attendance, especially of girls, and health improvements. Questions have been raised as to whether the conditionality is needed. Migrant children who do attend schools in cities usually get a worse education than their city-born counterparts. State schools that accept migrant pupils often operate what Pekia Lan of National Taiwan University refers to as apartheid school models. In these, migrant children are taught separately from urban ones in the same school, and are even kept apart from them in the playground. Migrant children who do attend schools in cities usually get a worse education than their city-born counterparts. State schools that accept migrant pupils often operate what Pekia Lan of National Taiwan University refers to as apartheid school models. In these, migrant children are taught separately from urban ones in the same school, and are even kept apart from them in the playground. Migrant children who do attend schools in cities usually get a worse education than their city-born counterparts. State schools that accept migrant pupils often operate what Pekia Lan of National Taiwan University refers to as apartheid school models. In these, migrant children are taught separately from urban ones in the same school, and are even kept apart from them in the playground. Migrant children who do attend schools in cities usually get a worse education than their city-born counterparts. State schools that accept migrant pupils often operate what Pekia Lan of National Taiwan University refers to as apartheid school models. In these, migrant children are taught separately from urban ones in the same school, and are even kept apart from them in the playground. As yet, the new explanation is incomplete. So far, the researchers have only computed the effects caused by one property of matter falling into a black hole, its electric charge. They have not shown the effect of its mass, which would also be important. Their calculations therefore account only for part of the information that is lost. But they have established a principle that may lead to a full accounting of the matter that would let physicists sleep easy in their beds, in the knowledge that reality is once again behaving, at least approximately, how they think it ought to. As yet, the new explanation is incomplete. So far, the researchers have only computed the effects caused by one property of matter falling into a black hole, its electric charge. They have not shown the effect of its mass, which would also be important. Their calculations therefore account only for part of the information that is lost. But they have established a principle that may lead to a full accounting of the matter. That would let physicists sleep easy in their beds, in the knowledge that reality is once again behaving, at least approximately how they think it ought to. How to look after all these elderly folks is a different problem. Governments around the world are already struggling to support growing numbers of retired people who depend on a shrinking working population. 18 OECD countries have raised pension ages. At the same time, workers are being asked to dig deeper into their own pockets. None of this is enough. How to look after all these elderly folks is a different problem. Governments around the world are already struggling to support growing numbers of retired people who depend on a shrinking working population. 18 OECD countries have raised pension ages. At the same time, workers are being asked to dig deeper into their own pockets. None of this is enough.
In this method, a laser is used to create a line of ionization by removing electrons from atoms. This laser is then directed at storm clouds in order to control electrical charges, a method which is less dangerous than using rockets. As protection for the lasers, the beams are aimed firstly at mirrors. In this method, a laser is used to create a line of ionization by removing electrons from atoms. This laser is then directed at storm clouds in order to control electrical charges, a method which is less dangerous than using rockets. As protection for the lasers, the beams are aimed firstly at mirrors. In Italy, some of these cities were able to gain control of the surrounding country and to become city-states resembling those of the ancient Greeks. Their autonomy was assisted by the continuing struggle between popes and emperors, between church and state, again, a thoroughly unique Western experience. In these states, the modern world began to take form. Although the people were mainly Christians, their life and outlook became increasingly secular. Here, and not only in Italy but in other cities north of the Alps, arose a worldview that celebrated the greatness and dignity of mankind, which was a very sharp turning away from the medieval Western tradition that put God and life in the hereafter at the center of everything. In Italy, some of these cities were able to gain control of the surrounding country and to become city-states, resembling those of the ancient Greeks. Their autonomy was assisted by the continuing struggle between popes and emperors, between church and state, again, a thoroughly unique Western experience. In these states, the modern world began to take form. Although the people were mainly Christians, their life and outlook became increasingly secular. Here, and not only in Italy but in other cities north of the Alps, arose a worldview that celebrated the greatness and dignity of mankind, which was a very sharp turning away from the medieval Western tradition that put God and life in the hereafter at the center of everything. The next topic is going to be black holes, and this is a similar situation. 15, 20 years ago black holes were sort of poised precariously on the boundary between theoretical physics and science fiction. A boundary that is more astronomy than you might believe. But again, in the past 15 years or so this has been converted into a standard topic in observational porous. There are dozens, probably hundreds of objects we can point to in the sky and say, yes those things are black holes. And so now, the current topic of research is do these things that we are pretty sure are black holes actually behave in the incredibly bizarre, science fiction manner that the theoretical physicists have been talking about for the past 30 or 40 years. So, to what extent are these very exotic behaviors actually manifested in real life? The next topic is going to be black holes, and this is a similar situation. 15, 20 years ago black holes were sort of poised precariously on the boundary between theoretical physics and science fiction. A boundary that is more astronomy than you might believe. But again, in the past 15 years or so this has been converted into a standard topic in observational porous. There are dozens, probably hundreds of objects we can point to in the sky and say, yes those things are black holes. And so now, the current topic of research is do these things that we are pretty sure are black holes actually behave in the incredibly bizarre, science fiction manner that the theoretical physicists have been talking about for the past 30 or 40 years. So, to what extent are these very exotic behaviors actually manifested in real life? In 1962, 
an English political scientist and journalist by the name of Bernard Prick wrote a short and very polemical and influential little book called In Defense of Politics, and by politics Crick meant a distinctive type of human activity where conflicts of interests among groups are adjudicated by discussion, persuasion and debate rather than by force or by fright. In 1962, an English political scientist and journalist by the name of Bernard Prick wrote a short and very polemical and influential little book called In Defense of Politics, and by politics Crick meant a distinctive type of human activity where conflicts of interests among groups are adjudicated by discussion, persuasion and debate rather than by force or by fright. Now, the emergence of tropical medicine marked a transition, a transformation, from something that had preceded it, and that I hope won't be confusing. But from the middle of the 18th century, more or less, until the closing decade of the 19th century, there had been an older tradition that can be summarized under the label of diseases of the tropics. And there were a couple of classic statements of this older tradition. One was a work, an important work, by James Lidd, an 18th century physician who wrote an essay on diseases incidental to Europeans in hot climates, and this was built on the experience of Europeans in the West Indies. And then there was another work by James Johnson called The Influence of Tropical Climates on European Constitutions, built on the experience of Europeans in India. Now, the emergence of tropical medicine marked a transition, a transformation, from something that had preceded it, and that I hope won't be confusing. But from the middle of the 18th century, more or less, until the closing decade of the 19th century, there had been an older tradition that can be summarized under the label of diseases of the tropics. And there were a couple of classic statements of this older tradition. One was a work, an important work by James Lidd, an 18th-century physician, who wrote an essay on diseases incidental to Europeans in hot climates, and this was built on the experience of Europeans in the West Indies. And then there was another work by James Johnson called The Influence of Tropical Climates on European Constitutions, built on the experience of Europeans in India. Um, I'm responsible for student admissions to the college and I use a computer system to help process student enrollments and to do the timetabling. But it really doesn't suit the way we work these days. It's over 10 years old and although it was fine when it was first introduced, it is just not good enough now. 20 years ago, the college was quite small and we didn't have the number of students and tutors that we have now. There's a lot more data now and it sometimes seems the system has crashed but, in fact, it just takes ages to go from one screen to the next. Um, I'm responsible for student admissions to the college and I use a computer system to help process student enrollments and to do the timetabling. But it really doesn't suit the way we work these days. It's over 10 years old and although it was fine when it was first introduced, it is just not good enough now. 20 years ago, the college was quite small and we didn't have the number of students and tutors that we have now. There's a lot more data now and it sometimes seems the system has crashed but, in fact, 
it just takes ages to go from one screen to the next. There are more than 160 known species of chameleons. The main distribution is in Africa and Madagascar, and other tropical regions, although some species are also found in parts of southern Europe and Asia. There are introduced populations in Hawaii and probably in California and Florida too. New species are still discovered quite frequently. Dr. Andrew Marshall, a conservationist from York University, was surveying monkeys in Tanzania, when he stumbled across a twig snake in the Megumbre forest which, frightened, coughed up a chameleon and fled. Though a colleague persuade him not to touch it because of the risk from venom, Marshall suspected it might be a new species. There are more than 160 known species of chameleons. The main distribution is in Africa and Madagascar, and other tropical regions, although some species are also found in parts of southern Europe and Asia. There are introduced populations in Hawaii and probably in California and Florida too. New species are still discovered quite frequently. Dr. Andrew Marshall, a conservationist from York University, was surveying monkeys in Tanzania when he stumbled across a twig snake in the Megumbre forest which, frightened, coughed up a chameleon and fled. Though a colleague persuade him not to touch it because of the risk from venom, Marshall suspected it might be a new species. One of the drawbacks of staying with the same organization is that the person may get stuck doing the same job year after year. In some cases, this can lead to boredom and disillusionment. Moving from one organization to another can be a strategic decision in order to have variety and acquire a range of skills and experience. The person may be incredibly knowledgeable in a range of fields by working in different organizations. One of the drawbacks of staying with the same organization is that the person may get stuck doing the same job year after year. In some cases, this can lead to boredom and disillusionment. Moving from one organization to another can be a strategic decision in order to have variety and acquire a range of skills and experience. The person may be incredibly knowledgeable in a range of fields by working in different organizations. Using the internet has become a normal part of everyday life for many people. They use it to book airline tickets, or to access news about world events, or to follow the fortunes of their favorite football club. Millions of people across the world belong to social networking groups where they keep in touch with their friends and, if they live away from them, their family. In my opinion, these are all good ways to use the internet.
Using the internet has become a normal part of everyday life for many people. They use it to book airline tickets, or to access news about world events, or to follow the fortunes of their favorite football club. Millions of people across the world belong to social networking groups where they keep in touch with their friends and, if they live away from them, their family. In my opinion, these are all good ways to use the internet. We don't have any databases on this sort of information. As well as that, these records of sound levels take no account of the fact that people vary in their perceptions of noise so someone like me with years of working in acoustics might be very different from you in that regard. But anyway, even though these noise maps are fairly crude they've been useful in providing information and raising awareness that noise matters, we need to deal with it and so it's a political matter. And that's important we need rules and regulations because noise can cause all sort of problems. Those of you who are city dwellers know that things go on 24 hours a day. We don't have any databases on this sort of information. As well as that, these records of sound levels take no account of the fact that people vary in their perceptions of noise so someone like me with years of working in acoustics might be very different from you in that regard. But anyway, even though these noise maps are fairly crude they've been useful in providing information and raising awareness that noise matters, we need to deal with it and so it's a political matter. And that's important we need rules and regulations because noise can cause all sort of problems. Those of you who are city dwellers know that things go on 24 hours a day. But the problem is that the amount of mercury in the environment is increasing. The main reason for this is the power plants used to produce electricity. The main source of energy that most of them use is still coal and when it's burned it releases mercury into the atmosphere. Some of this gets deposited into lakes and rivers, and if it's ingested by a fish it's not excreted, it stays in the fish's body and it enters the food chain so it's been known for some time that birds which eat fish may be affected, but what wasn't known until quite recently is that those that eat insects can also be affected. But the problem is that the amount of mercury in the environment is increasing. The main reason for this is the power plants used to produce electricity. The main source of energy that most of them use is still coal and when it's burned it releases mercury into the atmosphere. Some of this gets deposited into lakes and rivers, and if it's ingested by a fish it's not excreted, it stays in the fish's body and it enters the food chain so it's been known for some time that birds which eat fish may be affected, but what wasn't known until quite recently is that those that eat insects can also be affected. Another team of ethnographic researchers looked at how cell phones were used in Uganda, in Africa. They found that people who didn't have their own phones could pay to use the phones of local entrepreneurs because these customers paid in advance for their calls, they were eager to know how much time they'd spent on the call so far. So the phone company designed phones for use globally with this added feature.
another team of ethnographic researchers looked at how cell phones were used in Uganda, in Africa. They found that people who didn't have their own phones could pay to use the phones of local entrepreneurs because these customers paid in advance for their calls, they were eager to know how much time they'd spent on the call so far. So the phone company designed phones for use globally with this added feature. The walls are made of several layers of honey-colored wood, all sourced from local beech trees. In order to improve the acoustic properties of the auditorium and to amplify the sound, they are not straight they are curved the acoustics are also adjustable according to the size of orchestra and the type of music being played. The walls are made of several layers of honey-colored wood, all sourced from local beech trees. In order to improve the acoustic properties of the auditorium and to amplify the sound, they are not straight they are curved the acoustics are also adjustable according to the size of orchestra and the type of music being played. What she was interested in was marine mammals things like seals and she found three places in the oceans which were hot spots, and what these had in common was that these hot spots were all located at boundaries between ocean currents, and this seems to be the sort of place that has lots of the plankton that some of these species feed on. So now people who want to protect the species that are endangered need to get as much information as possible. For example, there's an international project called the Census of Marine Life. What she was interested in was marine mammals things like seals and she found three places in the oceans which were hot spots, and what these had in common was that these hot spots were all located at boundaries between ocean currents, and this seems to be the sort of place that has lots of the plankton that some of these species feed on. So now people who want to protect the species that are endangered need to get as much information as possible. For example, there's an international project called the Census of Marine Life. We can gain an accurate knowledge of the past only if we know the age of the different sources being investigated. Without this information, historians and archaeologists could not be sure of the order in which different areas were settled, used and abandoned. They would not always be sure if a particular object was real or forgery. We can gain an accurate knowledge of the past only if we know the age of the different sources being investigated. Without this information, historians and archaeologists could not be sure of the order in which different areas were settled, used and abandoned. 
they would not always be sure if a particular object was real or forgery.